All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam from the Kid Cop Crew with a very, very special guest, Mr. Lash LaRue himself, brother. How you doing? I'm tremendous. Here we are, brother, me and you face-to-face, -face, mano a mano. Man, it means a lot, man, because I know how busy, how extremely busy you are. So I, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know the guys are really excited to hear how this goes. So I know you ain't got long, so... Let's just jump right in it, brother. I know you've been doing a lot of drawing and cartooning and caricatures, man. Just would you like to talk about how how that got started? Sure. Why not, man? It kind of goes hand in hand with my wrestling career, believe it or not. I was really fortunate. I came right out of high school and I started college uh, thinking I was going to pursue one career choice. And I really ended up studying a lot on my own, picking up books from libraries and from bookstores on caricature, on illustration, cartoons. I even thought I wanted to do cartoons for comic strips, you know, and uh, I found out really, really quick, you didn't need a college education for that because <laughs> back then there was this thing called magazines before the internet made that obsolete. And you could just send cartoons to magazines. And if they liked your work, then they would publish it and pay you. And if they didn't, they would just say thanks, but no thanks. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to take a um, take about a, a semester off of college and see if I can make a career out of drawing cartoons, see if they're any good, see if I get any kind of feedback. And I had just sent out a batch of cartoons, had taken this semester off from, from college and had started watching wrestling again. I, I'd fallen away from being a fan throughout high school. And then right at this particular time, Nitro had just begun. The NWO hit and became really, really hot, and it caught my eye and drew me in. So I'm watching it on Monday nights, and they were doing the commercials for the open tryouts at the power plant. And I thought, man, I keep myself in decent shape. I, I had won a state championship in high school wrestling. I had won a state championship in high school football. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go over and just see if I can try out. I don't really think I'll make it. But maybe, maybe, just maybe I'll get lucky and I'll meet Sting and get to shake his hand or Lex Luger or Buff Bagwell or Hulk Hogan and have a cool story to tell all my buddies. Yeah. And so that was really the extent of my plan. And when I went to this three-day trial at the power plant, as difficult as it was, it just seemed to come natural to me. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough I got my foot in the door. Now, it took about another year or whatever for me to really – uh, get an opportunity on television and have some matches and establish myself. But once I started on the road, I found out really quick, you were on the road 300 days out of the year. Um, you were in a different town every night. They wanted you to be at the building at noon for a show that didn't go live on television until about 7 p.m. And so you had a lot of downtime if you didn't have interviews and pre-tapes and local media and things like that to do. So I began taking dry erase markers with me. And I'd go to the uh, locker rooms on the boards in there. I would start drawing the guys and draw little caricatures of the other wrestlers. And uh, of all people, Kurt Henning thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Mr. Perfect thought, this is hilarious. This is great. And he pushed me. He'd go me on. You know, he'd go, all right, draw Hulk Hogan. Um, okay. Now draw him really old. Uh, all right. Now draw him with a walker and an oxygen mask. I'm going, dude, he's in the other room. He's going to get out. He goes, he won't care. He won't care at all. And so – Guys like Bill After from the, the, the wrestling magazines and also Ross Foreman, who at the time was the editor of WCW magazine, they would watch me do this. And they thought, you know what, it'd be really cool if we had a wrestler to draw a cartoon for the wrestling magazines. And it was perfect for me because I wasn't expected to be a professional artist. I was a professional wrestler that could kind of sort of draw. Right. And so it gave me this great opportunity where I started doing a monthly cartoon and every month I would try to get better and better and outdo myself and learn more and start transitioning towards computers. And so me doing that about 10 or 15 years of my wrestling career allowed me to come out the other side, a polished professional published artist. So when I had this opportunity to do caricature work, I fell right into it, man, and pursued a whole nother degree. Oh, that is amazing, man. And and when you got Mr. Perfect kind of pushing you on, saying, hey, draw him, draw him, you, you don't want to say no to Mr. Perfect. I mean, it, it's Kurt Henning. So. That's exactly right. Kurt, who obviously was the king of ribs anyway, yeah. so anything that was a practical joke on somebody else, he's going to think is great. And he gave me this tremendous line that I still use to this day. You know, when I would go, oh, man, the guys are going to get hot if they see me drawing them like this. And he goes, oh, you just tell them, you don't write the news, you just report it. 
And so when I'm doing caricatures now, man, people will go, oh, you're going to make me look real funny. I'm going, hey, I don't write the news. I just record it. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it, man. So with, with Kurt Henning, though, did you ever pull a reel with him and you catch all the blame, even though he's the one that started it? <laughs> no, no, no. I tell you the reason, and the reason why is because this is is I was always super respectful of those guys, and I kind of knew my boundaries, and I knew I wasn't on the level where I better not be pulling ribs on guys like Kurt Henning and the Steiners and those guys. You oh know, God, no! Back on me because I'd be the young guy trying to act like a superstar. The flip side of that is what I can honestly say out of it, and I always wore this as a badge of honor, dude. Is is the fact that because I was so respectful to guys like Flair and Kurt Henney and Arn Anderson and, and these guys that had come before me, then they were always super respectful back. I mean, you learn in life, you get the amount of respect that you give to people. And if you just walk up to people demanding respect when you haven't proven yourself or offered it first, man, you're going about it the wrong way. Oh, and, and that's awesome. You know, you, you know, you joined the power plant and everything you you know when you're growing up, you know how you know give respect. You if you want it, you got to give it. But when you know, because I've got a little bit of training myself, you know. But you know when, when you get into the wrestling business, it feels like you learn a whole new level of respect. Sure, that's right. And it, I found, I've been yeah. telling my buddies on the on the podcast, and that's my number one thing: honesty and respect. You even respect is even higher to me in some standards because. Coming from the wrestling business, you know, it, it's just, it's amazing what you learn just by getting in there and just, you don't think you're going to learn what everything you do learn in the wrestling business. But I just have a huge thing about respect. And it's just, you proved my point to the guys the other day. Respect is just huge to me. And I can see it is to you as well. Well, and the, the amazing thing about it is this is if you're somebody that's worthy of respect, you generally don't have to ask for it, right? Yes, Most sir. people will gravitate towards you and want to give it to you uh, because you've proven yourself in some way or the other. And by the same token, you have to have this kind of built in uh, instinct so that when you step in the ring with somebody, you know right away, okay, this is a guy that's been around longer than me. This is a guy that's accomplished a lot more of the business than I have. I'm going to shut my mouth and keep my ears open unless he asks my opinion. Yeah, and if he asks my opinion and wants my input, maybe I'm going to offer it then. And then as you kind of pick and choose your battles and, and move those things in, or on the flip side, if you tell somebody that's a veteran, you go, you know what, that's a great idea. Let's do it that way. But I was also thinking maybe this works. And if it's something that makes them look even better than they would have looked otherwise, man, you've earned their respect. Because right away they know you're looking out for them. You're not being selfish, just trying to get your moves in, just trying to look good and go over on them. No, you're really out for who's gonna, what's gonna allow you to have the best match that you can have. They, they, I guess they pick up the fact that you want them to look just as good as you do. You're not just going out there and taking liberties on them. And that's right. I got you. And these around, they've been around. You get to that level. You've had enough matches by that point under your belt that you know right away whether you're in the ring with somebody that's out for themselves and in business for themselves mm -hmm. or if you're in the ring with somebody that is a professional and that they're doing whatever they can to get the match over. Because here's one of the lost arts, too, in, in this culture, in this era now where everybody wants to see what they can get. You know, they always want to get theirs out of it. And the truth of the matter is the big secret, you look at someone like a Ric Flair, why did Ric Flair have such longevity in his career? Because Ric Flair, even though he got over to the degree that he got over, and even though he was on the top of the heap for so long, Rick always worked for what makes the match the best match it can be. Because if I'm unselfish and we have a great match, if the match gets over, everybody gets over. If the match is over, it doesn't matter whether I won or I lost. I've made some kind of impact on the wrestling fans that they're going to remember. I mean, Dang, brother, I made a I made a career off of uh, coming to the ring and just trying to get the fans' attention. And I didn't, I wasn't winning a lot of matches then, but people <laughs> were remembering me. And they're going, hey, we want to see more of Lash LaRue, you know, and that works in your favor. So you can connect with the fans even without being the guy that wins every match. Yeah. I mean, they, they talk about how you ain't got to get over <clears throat> to get over, or you ain't got to go over to get over. That's what they say. Just because you're right. the match doesn't mean you can't be, a, you know, a, a really important part of the match. Here was my mentality, brother. Even when I started with WCW at the very beginning, obviously, I was nothing more 
than just an enhancement talent for the first six months or whatever of my career. And I knew right away, I'm going to walk to the ring and I'm going to get squashed in probably four or six minutes. Right. And, but here was my mentality. My mentality was not, Oh man, you mean I, I got to make somebody else look good again tonight? No, my mentality, my thought process was not only can I earn the respect of the guy that I'm in the ring with, because my job tonight is to make him look really good and shine him up. But also what are they gifting me? They're giving me, 30 seconds for me going through that curtain till I get to that ring. That's my time. And I'm on live TV or this is taped for TV. And whatever I want to do during that time to connect with the fans is up to me. And either I can make the most of it or I can just kind of walk to the ring like I'm upset that, that I know things aren't going to go my way. No, I'm going to come through the curtain. I'm going to hit my moves. I'm going to do the double L thing. I'm going to point to my sideburns. I'm going to throw out some Mardi Gras beads. We're going to and I'm going to act like I think I'm winning this thing. Oh, yeah, because if you come out already beaten, they already know the end of the match, and it doesn't really get them excited or looking forward to it. Yeah, it kills it. Kills it right out the gate. Uh, so you said you started out in the power plant, though, um, and I met, that's when I met you and Sarge, you know, coming to a, um, to a church down here in town. How was yeah. he working with, with Sarge? I mean, because he's he's not a big, big guy, but – you talking about I can pick up a car and chunk it. This man, when he shook my hand, I thought my hand was done. I thought I lost it. Yeah, he was a tank. He was a tank. And he was some one of those kind of guys that right out the gate, you're either going to earn his respect or you're probably never going to be friends with him. And the reason why I say that is he was built from that cloth, man, that was, hey, you're the one that called us. You said you want to be a, a, a wrestler. Well, prove it to us. Show us what you got. And you called us. We didn't call you. So if you can't do this, I'm not listening to excuses. I'm not wanting reasons or your explanations for why you're not getting it. Brother, you're, we're going to tell you what to do, and you either do it or you can get out of here. And I can remember the first time I ever met Sarge in my life was simply that first day of the power plant tryout. And as soon as he walks in the door, you don't know what to expect. You're walking in this, basically it was a warehouse at that point with three wrestling rings in it. And are we getting in the wrestling ring? Or what do I, how do I even get into a wrestling ring? I've never been around the business before in my life or anything, right? No, he walks in, this guy that's probably about uh, five, six, five, eight, but 240 pounds of just built like a Rubik's cube, man. You don't want to mess with him, you know? And so he'll come in and he was a legitimate coast guard drill sergeant back in the day when he's in the military. And so he'll come in. Yeah. And he would just throw his bag down and go grab a bucket and you grab a bucket. What buckets? And you look and there's like five gallon paint buckets that are up against the wall and you're expected to grab one, flip it upside down. And then you start doing those free Hindu squats and oh. just touch and go and go touch and go. You're a hundred at a time. And then you go up and down and do push ups, And then you flip over and you do crunches and then you run in place. And then, a hundred more squats and that was constant all day long. And the reason why those tryouts were notorious, it was because so many guys would come in thinking they were athletes and they would be, you know, 15 minutes into the tryout or an hour into the tryouts and their legs would just cramp up. They couldn't do any more squats and they would collapse They'd fall out or they'd go to the bathroom and start pissing blood or, you know, something like that. And and Sarge would tell him, look, you called us. We didn't call you. If you can't do it, get out. Except he didn't say it as nicely as I just said it. <laughs> well, I can imagine. That's, I, yeah, that's the reason why it was, in the, it was a war of attrition, brother. You'd show up and you'd have 24 guys that want to try out. And at the end of the first day, there's 16 left. And at the end of the second day, there's eight left. And then on the third day, there's one or two people show up. You know, um, they really wanted to make sure it was almost like going through buds training for the seals or something. We're going to call this thing out and see who's the pretenders and who's the contenders. And, but you can imagine, though, it, it probably takes a man like that to deal with the attitudes that he gets because you got these guys, oh, I can do this, ain't no problem. Or they have the mentality like, oh, this thing ain't real. Yeah, you say something like that to a guy, named, to a guy like Swords or somebody, they'll show you what's real and what's not. Well, that's right. I and mean, the flip side of that is this, is you, you also had two factors at play. And the first one is very true, what you're talking about, is that was an era where you're still protecting the business. Mm -hmm. So you don't want people coming in. I can remember we did one particular tryout, and they had some publication there 
uh, covering it. I want to think it was maybe Playboy magazine or someone was doing an article on it. And so, yeah, and, and we, we would have media in all the time because back then the power plant was the place for training, right? Yeah. And so they're there and they're interviewing the guys that are actually trying out. And so they go up to one of the guys and says, so what do you think so far? And the guy said, well, I think these guys are great actors. Oh, actors. Oh, oh we oh, dropped oh. everything. He put the guys into the ring. And one of Sarge's favorite things to do, and I don't mind patting myself on the, on the back a little bit on this one, was he'd get someone like me. Because I was never the biggest guy, and I was never the jacked-up body guy. So I may have looked a little average, but, dude, I had some wrestling skills. I won a state championship in high school. I was what they would call a shooter. I could put you in some moves, and I could hook you. And he knew that, and he could put me in with somebody that thought that they were an elite athlete, and I could just school them and take them down and wrap them up. And there's nothing more humiliating. You get in a fist fight as a grown man, and you, everybody's got a story of what happened. Well, I hit him. No, he hit me. No, I did this. I did that. But if you get in a ring with someone that can wrestle yeah. and they put you in a hole you can't get out of, there's no question who won that confrontation. You know exactly. What I, mean? I think that's what Stu Hart was. He just, hey, you, you – he bring them coaches in. Oh, you think it's a fake call? Oh, well, you come here and within two minutes, it's all tied up. You're not you're not going nowhere. It's humbling. It's extremely yeah. humbling. And so the first reason for that type of mentality with the training back then was because, number one, you wanted to protect the business, and you want to still give it that air of it's real and it's tough and it's difficult. And number two, which is kind of connected to number one, is back then because we still talk, treated it like it was real and we didn't refer to it as just entertainment, what you have to keep in mind is, all right, we're going to send you out as a wrestler representing us and you're going to be on live TV. What if you get thrown over the top rope, you hit the ground and you blow your knee out? Are you going to go, oh, 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 I can't continue the match because I've hurt my knee for real? No, if it's a real wrestling competition – and you hurt your knee for real, I mean, we're going to try to take care of you and work through it and get to a finish, but you don't just stop the match. It's live TV because if it was a real wrestling contest and you hurt your knee, I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to hit you on the knee. I'm going to put you in a figure four leg. Lock. Why wouldn't I if I'm really trying to legitimately win a match? So you protect the business. Speaking of the figure four, uh, my buddy Brad on the, on the crew, he always asks me, hey, man, does it really hurt? When they flip it, does it hurt? You're the. You, you can tell me right now. You can. You can probably tell him in, in experience how bad the figure four hurts, and I, when you flip it or it gets flipped on you, how bad that hurts. Well, here's the thing about it, and what you have to keep in mind, and anybody that's a fan of what you see in MMA now will kind of understand what I'm about to say. Everything in wrestling, even the stuff that's worked in its entertainment, for it to be believable, it has to be based on real actual moves, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense, and you might as well be watching a movie. That's the difference between us and just seeing someone put on a stage fight, because a stage fight is going to be a lot of punches, and half of them are going to miss. But when you're having a wrestling contest, you're doing all these moves, and the best moves that are the most believable are the ones based on actual holds. So all you have to do is think about the dynamics of a figure four leg lock and the physics of that. If you slide your leg between someone else's leg and you bend it at the joint and place their ankle on top of their own knee and then apply pressure by hooking your other leg on that foot, obviously with that, you're going to apply that pressure and you can dislocate somebody's knee by applying pressure from their own heel on top of their own knee. Um, another mentality on that or another angle on that is if you really wanted to do it for real, if you were doing a shoot version of that, you could take your own foot after you hook their ankle with your, with your knee, you take your own foot and you grapevine it under their thighs like amateur wrestlers do. And now you're locked in. They're not going to get your foot out from behind their thigh if you were really trying to put it on somebody. By the same token, when you roll it over and you do what we always see as the reversal, the other person can then, they've allowed, instead of you being put into a hold that is pushing your joint the opposite direction it's supposed to go, now you've rolled over so that you can bend your joint the direction it is supposed to go. And now the other person's joint is going in the opposite direction. That's the reason why something like that is believable is because it's based in reality. You say, Brad, he says it right there. The figure four hurts, brother. And when I get you in in that Top Guy weekend, you're going to feel how bad it hurts. <laughs> there you go. But um, I know, like I said, I know the power plant. We know a lot about the wrestling part. 
But what you're doing more now, are you are you still doing any wrestling or is it just caricatures now? I mean, it's just been caricature stuff up until I did started doing the uh, ad free show, the time limit draw with Lash LaRue that we do on Tuesday nights once a month. Before that, man, I was not even dipping my toe into the wrestling business. And uh, I've been retired now from it for probably about 13 years, man, or close to it. And I started super young and I retired super young. And it was one of those deals where it just felt like the time was right. And I always wanted to be that guy that if I said I was retiring, I wasn't going to be back in six months. And it wasn't some angle or it wasn't some storyline. And it wasn't, oh, I'm going to leave town for a little bit. And then we're going to find a way to bring me back in. No, the night that I decided I was going to retire, I literally had, it was the main event on the card. I knew I could have a great match with the guy I was wrestling. Um, I knew we'd go out there and tear the house down, which we did. I didn't cut a promo. I didn't say so long to the fans. I told the guy I was wrestling that it was going to be my last match. I rolled out of the ring and never got back in the ring after that. So do you, do you remember who this person was that was in your last match? Or do you care to mention it? Bull Buchanan. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I've met Bull, man. He's a great guy. Phenomenal guy. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story about that because this is hilarious. <laughs> so the night I finally decided I was going to retire, I'd had some nagging injuries, and I'd also lost a lot of passion for it, man. And that happens in wrestling, and especially if you're young and you get a lot of success young, and then you feel like the success isn't really coming, then it seems like when you're not successful, those injuries hurt a little bit more. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and, definitely. You know, or if life just isn't going your way, it's easy for you to start spiraling down a little bit and not caring as much. And I had fallen into that black hole a little bit. I'll be the first to admit it. And I was getting out of shape, and I just wasn't feeling good. And I wasn't enjoying the wrestling business anymore. And when I wasn't enjoying it anymore, I knew it was time to walk away. And, again, I, I saw that I was wrestling Bull that night. I saw him backstage. I said, dude, I know you and I can have a great match. I'm retiring tonight. This is going to be my last match. Huh. And, and Barry, who's a great guy, he doesn't live too far from me, actually. He's from Carrollton, Georgia over here. Oh, wow. And so right across the Georgia line. And so we had spent a lot of time traveling together and hanging out together and being over at each other's house. And, um, and he said, yeah, all right, man, whatever, you know, it kind of blew me off. We went out, had our normal regular match. I rolled out of the ring. That was it. The only people that knew I was retiring was my family. And, uh, you know, a few years go on and a few years go on. And then I saw Barry again for the first time. And this is actually the first time I'd been around the wrestling, a wrestling ring in probably 10 years, I guess it was maybe the year before COVID hit or uh, maybe a few months before COVID hit. They did a show in Oxford, Alabama, which is my hometown. And uh, they were having some kind of an Alabama pro wrestling hall of fame event. Okay. And they had invited Arn over because they were putting Arn into this pro wrestling hall of fame. And they were also bringing Arn in, to have a uh, workshop that day for our local wrestlers to try to learn a little bit and train up to the next level. And I knew the promoter, so I called the promoter. I said, dude, I never go around wrestling shows. I haven't been to a wrestling show since I retired, but I know Arn's going to be in town. Do you mind if I just come to the workshop? Because if I come to the show, everybody's going to think I'm back in the wrestling business. Yep. I just want to come to the workshop. I want to shake Arn's hand, and I want to tell him thank you for all the help that he gave me and guidance he gave me in WCW. And he said, of course, man. Last year, you're welcome anytime. You know that. I said, cool. So I showed up, and, uh, you know, Barry, Bull Buchanan has a has a son now that's in the wrestling business. I think he's an NXT. Just a big, yoked up, great young man. Phenomenal athlete. Matter of fact, he was the best of that crew. Well, he was about 16 or 17 at the time, and he had brought him over because he wanted his son to be able to meet Arn and learn a little bit from Arn that day. So I walk in, and there's Big Barry, you know, and I, I come up to about his chest, yep. I think, because he's so big. And so I walk up to him, he sees me, and I see him, and he goes, Flash, and he gives me a big hug. You know, he goes, Dude, I haven't seen you in 10 years. Where you been? I said, Man, I told you I was retiring that last match we had. He goes, Dude, I thought it was a rib. <laughs> that would have been a heck of a rib for me to carry it on that long. Exactly. That's working it right there, brother. It is working the long game. <laughs> All right, so you, you're doing a lot of traveling lately, but it's just strictly for the caricatures. I mean, how how yeah. is that going? I know you do weddings and stuff like that, man. How How is it? And you still enjoying it? And I love it, man. And, and the reason why is because it kind of scratches the itch. I was never the guy in wrestling that – 
hated the travel. I enjoyed the travel. I actually, one of the, one of the things that was exciting about the wrestling business to me was being able to travel all over the United States and all over the world. And uh, luckily for me, uh, now that I do these caricature events, a lot of what I do are in markets like Birmingham and Atlanta and Chattanooga and Nashville. So I'll drive off. I'll do these one day events. I'll do a wedding or wedding reception. And that allows me to interact with people the same way I would interact with fans. So, you know, I get a little touch of that again. I get to perform because there's a little bit of performance to the drawing and making it live like that, doing it in real time. And I get to tell some wrestling stories because people will recognize me and ask me about wrestling. And but what I really love right now that I'm doing a lot of is I've started getting booked for a lot of conferences. Wow. And these people will fly me into conference for like a three-day trade show. And the reason why is because the big game at trade shows and at conferences is whatever it is that you're there to sell, the only way that you sell it is by drawing a lot of people to your booth, right? And uh, one of the things that I do is I do a digital version of my caricatures. You know, I do the traditional thing, which is where I just draw on paper, rip it off, and give it to you. But I do these digital caricatures. And with the digital caricatures, yeah, it's similar to that, man. And so what I do, yeah, when I'm drawing, it's like doing the time limit draw deal, man. I have the screen up so that the people can see what I'm drawing, but the person I'm drawing can't see it. And so what we do is I'll draw them live. That big screen that has the artwork on it starts getting people's attention and everyone wants to come to the booth to see what's going on. Then they realize I'm drawing a caricature of someone live. And it only takes me about six or eight minutes to draw somebody like that live. We do it really quickly. And as soon as I get through drawing it, I print it out four by six on a little selfie printer I have. And that goes on a lanyard that is, uh, you know, sort of like this size top lanyard. And someone can wear that around their neck. And now their name tag at the trade show becomes their caricature. And it also has printed underneath it the company's information. So that whenever they're walking around the rest of the conference or the rest of the expo or the rest of the workshop for the next three days, Every time someone asks, where'd you get that drawing? Well, they have to show them the company information. They come over to the booth and that draws even more traffic to the booth. And, you know, inevitably people will, will hear that, you know, Lash LaRue, former wrestlers over there drawing it. That draws some people in as well. So people will fly me out and, and uh, put me up and, and have me at their booth for these three day expos. And I just draw, man, 10 hours straight, just sitting there one person right after the other. And I love it. I absolutely love it. See, we got to figure out a way to factor in like an entrance, you know, because that was the, the most the most fun I would have coming down to the ring. So we got to get you like some kind of music, like an entrance to your booth. And here comes Lash. You know, you start throwing out beads again. We got yeah, to do that. I the whole <laughs> That's exactly right. Smoke, power, bill. And that would be the perfect beads. gig. Yeah, yeah. I love doing it, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't ruled out wrestling. You know, the great thing about the career that I had is I started super young. I was like 18. And then I retired by the time I was 30 or 32, you know. And so I I got uh, I got into the business really young, got out really young. I don't have any real lingering uh, injuries. And so I'm really physically as fit right now as I was when I was wrestling. And because I retired so young, a lot of people don't realize that even though I'm from the generation that's a little before people like, say, John Cena and uh, CM Punk and Randy Orton and those guys are Kenny Omega. Even though I may be from a generation right before those guys really started their career, I'm actually about the same age as a lot of those guys. Yeah. You know, I just turned 46. So, you know, I'm not too young for one more run. <laughs> and, and you definitely don't look like in your later 40s, brother. I tell you, you're still in the well, amazing shape, man. Thing. But I know um I don't want to keep you too long. I know you got plenty to do and everything, but there is one more and one more thing I was wanting to touch and let everybody know of. You're really big in, into your faith and religion and everything. You're are you still doing the um you're still is it the is the youth pastor you're doing? Yeah, I'm actually associate pastor at a church here in Amherst, Alabama. So I'm the associate fa pastor of of uh students and families. There you go. Anderson his church in McClellan and in fact I just preached yesterday as a matter of fact in the main service um, you know there's some of that stuff is online you know if you go on Facebook we usually live stream our our, um, 
our worship services. And so people can probably, if they dug deep enough, find some uh, sermons on there. Hmm. But I preach on a pretty regular basis and I'm on staff there. Um, obviously, the caricature work allows me to do ministry work because if you're doing that right, you're not getting rich off of the Lord. But uh, <laughs> so I certainly don't make a good living from a ministry work but I'm able to do so well off my caricature work that it compensates and balances it out. So yeah, man, I'm on staff there and I've been in ministry now for about 11 years. So I'm an ordained Southern Baptist pastor. That's awesome, man. And, and, and you know, you, you have the voice, you have the announcer voice, you have, you know, if somebody hears your voice, they'll go, oh, wow. Man, that's... So you catch people's attention. And I can imagine you being up there preaching, you know, doing the sermon and everything. Cause I guarantee you, you catch some attention from people. Well, I, I tell you, I appreciate it. And the, what I'm really thankful that God has given me the opportunity for and what I'm grateful for is if someone asks me to come to their church or if I do some special event, then I'm not some athlete that's just coming and giving my one-time testimony. And I'm not knocking that. That's a great thing. I love to hear athletes give their testimony and, and talk about what brought them to their faith and and gave them that salvation experience. And now they can share that with other people. It's wonderful to share that. But here's the thing, man, you can only hear that story once, right? You can hear someone's testimony one time and you know the story. Um, I love the idea of being able to just actually take the Bible and teach it and preach it in a way that every time I'm bringing something fresh, and it came from the years of me wrestling, actually. People would find out that even back then in the WCW days, I was still a born again Christian. And so they would ask me to come and speak to their groups or speak to their church. And I started out like a lot of those other athletes where I just felt kind of duty bound and obligated to come and share my testimony. But the more I shared my story with people, the more other people would open up and share their story. And then I realized that whether you're on TV or not on TV, everybody's got a story. Yes, everybody's been stuff in their life, right? We know that. Everybody has. You can come and tell me things about your life. And as I'm listening to other people, I recognize that, hey, if everybody's got a story, then I don't want every time I talk to a group to be just about me. Yep. I want it to be about God and what God means to me and what he's done for me in my life and, and how that can help other people. And that kind of led me more towards ministry and preaching and teaching as opposed to just talking about myself all the time. Gotcha. That's awesome, man. That's awesome to hear, brother. Yeah. But I can only brag on Lash LaRue so much. I got to brag on the Lord more. No. There you go. You got to you gotta go behind the scenes to the real pillow. Yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> Fill away the layers of the onion. Well, I do appreciate it, man. Like I, said, I don't want to keep you too long. I know how super busy you are. But um, where can people catch you? You know, get get the, the links and stuff where they can get caricatures and stuff like that. Where can they find you? You got it. You can you can follow me on Twitter. That's the only social media platform I'm on right now. And that's at Lash Can Draw. I'm currently working on a website, but that's not quite up yet. But you can find me on Twitter through at Lash Can Draw. You can also email me. I still have my same old school email address, <laughs> lashwcw at aol.com. What a throwback that is, right? I yeah, never you, let that go. You and sent me so, that one. I was like, hey, oh, well, wait a minute. What? Is this, is this right? And, and lash WCW, AOL.com. Any inquiries, if you're interested in booking me for an event and you want me to come and draw caricatures for a party or a bar mitzvah or a wedding or anything like that, I do that. I do, I do college campuses all the time. You know, I do corporate uh, lunches and picnics and things like that. Anything and everything. If there's an event where there's going to be a lot of people at it, caricatures always add an element to that. So I get a lot of offers for bookings off that. You can also email me at either one of those places, send a direct message through Twitter or email me and ask about a commission. Like the poster that you just showed and, and held up, man, I draw caricatures of people that way as well. You can just easily uh, send me over most of the time when I'm talking to people, they can just email me a reference photo of whoever it is they want me to draw. I go by the reference photo. I do it all digitally on my iPad. So I can either email it right back to them and you can tell them out of how easy the process is that if I send you that great file, man, you can upload it right to your local photo center, whether it's Walmart or yep. Walgreens or CVS, man, they'll print it right up for you. Poster size. You're good to go. Yeah, see, I've got, there's my Owen Hart right here, right there. Yep. And there's my Razor Ramon. That was my, my Scott Hall. That's my favorite, brother. 
That's awesome. Well, in all these prints that you're pointing out, as a matter of fact, that we did on Tom Limit Draw for the last year, a little bit more than a year now, um, they're all still currently available, too. I individually sign and number each one of those. I autograph those individually to each person, and they're available as well. You can DM me, or you can send me an email to ask me how you can get your hands on them. That's awesome, man. Thank you so much. And uh, I just, I'm just, you have no idea how how grateful I am that you give me time because, like I said, we, we chat a little bit every now and then, and you're always busy, but you always find time to get back to me. And I always appreciate that, brother. Well, thank you, man. I believe strongly in that, that no matter how busy you are, you have to make time for the people that you care about. And I believe in doing that, man. And so thank you for noticing that. Thank you so much, man. And this is, this has been Lash LaRue, former tag team champion and future Hall of Famer. Cruise so, Yeah, absolutely. All right, brother. Well, I mean it, man. Hey, we just let the good times roll. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. This is Adam from Bama from the Kick Out Crew, guys. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Lash. You got it, my friend.